find a sermon outline in your bulletin, and if you're listening, watching online, uh, it's downloadable from our website, makes it way easier to follow. Uh, certainly, uh, you can use your Bible 
We're using the New International, New American Standard Version um, here, and the uh, handout, uh, the um, sermon outline, has a what we call a phrase by phrase breakdown because that's how we look at things. Ideas connect to ideas that connect to ideas. We want to see how they connect, and we certainly want to know God from them and apply them to our lives. It gives us um, kind of a way that God thinks through things, and uh, we need to think through things the same way. Uh, for example, it's one thing to say, um, don't steal. It's another thing to give you the mindset of God on not stealing, something as simple as that. So we're going to look phrase by phrase through God's Word. We'll get as far as we get. Uh, it is Father's Day, by the way. It is Father's Day today, Fuzz, right? Okay, yeah, it is, all right? Um, so we're going to ask the question at the front end, what do you get for dad? What do you get for your husband? You know, what, what, what is the, if you've forgotten, which probably a number of us have, it, it is Father's Day. Uh, yeah, what, if you forgot, what, what do you get for dad? And I'm glad you asked because uh, that's what our te text is about today. It's about a great gift or a, a number of great gifts for dad. Um, what about uh, understanding his God-given need to labor, not be a workaholic, but to labor. Uh, what about, uh, here's a good one, what about edification? That's up building. I'm going to talk about that today. What about a spirit of worship in the house? And again, as I go through this list, I'm very much affirming my wife and many of the ladies that are here. Uh, but this is an affirmation. This is also, as needed, a correction or at least for the day. Uh, some edification. Uh, what about a spirit of worship uh, in the home and in the relationship? Uh, what about a, uh, yeah, for some of us, a reprieve from anger and clamor. Clamor is just yelling about stuff. To, uh, here's a great word, kindness and forgiveness. Going to hopefully get to that today. Uh, what about some love? Going to talk about that. Hopefully, we'll get to that as well. Uh, here, here's, here's the perfect gift for dad today. Give him Christian lady, Christian child. Give him the new you. Amen? And that is the greatest gift of all. Give him the new you. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful privilege that we have to be able to talk through these things today. Thank you for this text before us. Very practical, very much from the character and the heart of God, the great Father. Uh, thank you again for our dads uh, that are here, those that are listening, the uh, um, online stuff. Uh, Father, we pray for your blessing of healing on those that are hurting and on fullness of well-being and life for our spiritual dads and our blood dads. Thank you for great grace operating through us. Guide us to be a blessing, a great blessing to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and again dig into our text. Um, in verse 22, in regard to your old self, the formal way that you lived, Lay aside the old lady, the old man, the old person. That old person is being corrupted according to the lusts of deceit. Things that seem to work, and they're of the world, and they end in futility. And you can study that in verses 17 through 19. We're not going to review that again. We've gone through that the last two weeks. A life of futility. Live following whatever makes me feel good. Number two, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Get to know Christ, verse 20 and 21. And that's, this is verse 23 we're reading from. And number three, verse 24, put on the new person, the new self, which is a wonderful gift of God to you and to your spouse, 
in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Again, if you want information on that, we've talked about those um, uh, verses in the past. It's a choice, though. There's an old self vying for a position today and every day. There's a new, if I'm a believer, if I'm trusting Christ, that's the evidence that there's a new self as well, made in the image of God in righteousness and holiness or piety of truth, pursuit of the truth. We're going to talk about the truth today. Last week, here's two of the... Um, uh, 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 two things in the new life, two, two practices, two qualities in the new life. Verse 25, therefore, because we are to put on the new self, laying aside falsehood, we have nothing to do with falsehood any longer, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. The reason given here, besides God is truth, that's in the context, we are members one of another. We don't lie in marriage and we don't lie in the church family because we are of the same body, the body of Christ. That's the driving force. That's the reason why we do not deceive each other. That's done. That's the past. It's never a good idea in any circumstance. Verse 29, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse 26, next run, number two. Be angry and yet don't sin. So angry is a command, a righteous anger, or, and or it's a concession. It's a human emotion that's going to arise from pain or frustration or fear. When it arises, number one, make sure it doesn't lead to sin. Number two, figure it out before the sun goes down. Number three, don't give Satan an opportunity. When we get revved up like that, man, he can enter in and wreak havoc in us and through us. All that by way of review from last week. And then number three today, the three, the third thing in the new life, dads, moms, children, let's appreciate this work of God. Verse 28, let him who steals, steal no longer. Remember the first time you stole something? You got to see the expressions right now. There's a couple of elbows going on. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're as innocent as the driven snow, right? Yeah, you know, don't steal. We know, you know, a number of these things you'll find that just intuitively, because we bear the image of God in all religions to some degree or another, although it's lacking in many, it seems, but they speak about it on the surface, it is wrong to steal. Depends on how you define it and all. And we kind of get to, we, we kind of know that just, just as humans, even if we're quote an atheist, we, we tend to know and there's something wrong about that. We don't want it done to us. So it's probably a bad thing to do to other people, you know, um, but the rationale given here is a little different than what you pick up in the world. Let him who steals, steal no longer. Knock it off. Don't steal anymore. Don't steal time from your boss. Don't steal a paperclip. Don't steal anything that doesn't belong to you from your boss, your neighbor, or anybody else. There's such a thing in the Bible as private property. If it doesn't belong to you, it doesn't belong to you. All right? Don't steal. Don't steal from God. Matthew, uh, Malachi chapter 3. Will a man rob God, yet you're robbing me and, you're, and withholding your tithes and your offerings. I didn't mention his offering buckets uh, around the room, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I, I own it all. And I'm entrusting to you um, my money, God says, as stewards. Don't steal from me. Here's how I want you to use it. Start with at least a tithe. That's, you know, if you don't do that, that's stealing from God, according to Malachi chapter 3. For example, so we can't steal from other people. We can't steal from God. We give what is owed. We pay what is owed. And we are full of integrity when it comes to this whole thing of stealing. That's straightforward. But rather, and now this is the part I want to get into... Let him labor. And the word here for the translated labor, uh, if, if your version has uh, work, that's kind of weak. It, it is the, the word for toil. It's the word for really work hard. Now, if you're smart and you're able to make money and not you know, have to work at it, 
good for you, but that's not all the work that God's calling you to do. It's not just a matter of making money as we're going to get into. Let him labor. This is what we're designed for. I don't know of any warnings. Maybe you all can help me out with that. I don't know of any warnings in the Bible that, 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 that say, be careful you don't work too hard. You might get burnout. I hear it all the time. If somebody can find me such a warning, I'd really like to, because I want to be a balanced pastor. I want to teach the right. I can't think of any passage anywhere that says, be careful you don't work too hard. Now, there are certain warnings about, be careful about your priorities as you work hard. Do not neglect your worship and your God. Do not neglect your wife and your family, for example. But as far as keeping the engine going and working hard six days a week, I don't know of any warnings, though I, many of you, and I love y'all, and I know you're saying it in love, say, you're working too hard, don't work so hard. I'm going, you give, give me the verse when you say that to me. Give me the verse. Okay, now if I'm in imbalance, neglecting my wife, you perceive, or whatever, then come to me, talk to me, all right? Let him who steals, steal no longer. Here's what I want you to do, I want you to labor. I want you to labor really hard. There seems to be four types of people in the world. First of all, there's thieves, people who are just looking to steal from you. Second of all, there's the entitlement crowd. They expect you to support them, or the government, or whoever. Well, if the government supports everybody, it's all free, right? We're entitled, you know, government support everybody in every way. We all retire. There's the stingy that God has blessed, but man, they got a grip on things. And, you know, and then there's the generous. And God is a generous God and wants us to be generous. Performing, back to the text now, next phrase. Let him labor. Don't steal, labor. Work really, really hard. Performing with your own hands what is good, that's a general word for good, just do good things for your employer and in ministry for others, in order that he may have something to share or give to him who has need. In the Bible, in the New Testament, there's three things that, are, that come out. One is Christians are to give to the poor. Those who, who have a need of, of food and shelter, that kind of thing. Uh, that's a big deal, Matthew 25. You know, as you do to one of the least of these, you do to me. As you don't do to one of the least of these, you don't do to me. Matthew 25 is a heavy, heavy passage. You know, 1 John uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. Um, is it possible to say we have the love of God in us and know a brother in need and do nothing? Okay, is that even a possibility? All right. So, I mean, many, many times we're incited to really have a heart for the poor and do what we can to help them out. And that's the, that's the uh, Christian brothers and sisters, but it's also uh, others uh, that are outside the body of Christ. And that's local and global. lot in the Bible about that. Probably the biggest passage you can read on this is 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. It's a real sign of the grace of God when people just... just they, 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 they storm the gates to be able to give to brothers and sisters globally that are in need. Read that. Study through it. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Not going to do it right now. Uh, we give to missionaries. That's the second thing in the New Testament. Uh, those are people in need. They are uh, uh, giving of their, their lives to, the, to, um, uh, to reach others and plant churches. And uh, we are to support them. And then there's elders and churches that we support as well. Those seems to be, seem to be the three big ones. The poor probably at the top of the pile. But missionaries are important, and I think elders are somewhat important as well. The whole church thing. So we give to those who are in need. So what's the driving force here? The driving force here is love. Why we labor hard? We labor because we're driven by love for others. It's not just making a living to support my family. It's going way beyond that, going, what do I need to support the family? What can I give away? That's the heart. That's the Christian heart. Can I work harder to have more time or money to give away? 
Uh, there are those that are working hard. They think they can retire early and devote greater amounts of time to ministry. It's a marvelous thing. There are others who are making the dough and they see as a major part of their ministry sending great sums of money to support missionaries and that kind of thing. It's a marvelous ministry. But the point is, in Christians, it's not laboring so I can get more stuff. We live a simple life. We're stewards. We labor to certainly support our family. But then to go beyond that, to support those in need. Elders, missionaries, and certainly the poor. Let me give you a couple passages on this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. And again, it's Father's Day, so I want you uh, ladies, if you would, children, um, again, you, your husband, I'm not giving him license to neglect you. Got to keep priorities. But if he's got to drive to labor, he's a Christian guy, he's got to drive to labor hard and be generous, you know, affirm that. That's a good thing. If he has a, 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 a drive to, to labor in ministry because he's retired and able to do that, uh, affirm that. 1 Thessalonians 2.9, Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica, says this, You recall, brethren, this is 1 Thessalonians 2.9. It's a church in, in, in northern uh, Greece, and he spent some time there. They spent some time there, he and his missionary buddies. A uh, church was planted. He writes back to them, and he says, You recall, brothers, listen now, our labor and hardship, that's what we did when we were among you. How working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Their, their goal was to proclaim the gospel, but to support themselves. They had to work with leather and things like that to make money to support themselves and to give to others the gospel and their lives. They labored they were in labor and hardship, working night and day. Seemed to be a way of life for them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, writing to the church again, a little bit later. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof, hold back, don't show close friendship. Love them, but don't show close friendship. Don't, don't pretend like everything's okay. Keep aloof from every brother, person who calls themselves a Christian, who leads an unruly life, not according to the tradition which you receive from us. This is how important this is, this whole thing of God's design in our lives to labor. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We taught you with words. We taught you with example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. We didn't eat anyone's bread without praying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept, we kept working night and day. That's an example to you all to follow. So that we might not be a burden to any of you. So worked in ministry, worked making money, worked night and day to give their lives away. Verse 9. Not because we didn't have the right to it, but in order that we ourselves might be a model for you, that you might follow our example. Even when we were with you, we gave this, you this order. If anyone chooses not to work, neither let him eat. Don't support idleness. Some people can't work. We want to support them. They're trying to get a job, they can't, physical infirmity, whatever, whatever, that happens. We want to support the poor. It's huge in the Old Testament, New Testament. Same time, folks that simply will not work, love them by saying, You're not gonna, we're not going to feed you either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. That's what happens when we're idle, fallen nature. Such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Do not grow weary in doing good. That's a hard command. And so we want to discern who, we're tr who truly needs help and help them to the hilt. But those that, that, that refuse to work, 
they are to go hungry enough to choose to get a job and to work and to enter in this whole thing of helping other people as well. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. In everything, this is Paul spending time with the uh, leadership of the uh, elders in, uh, in Ephesus. He was outside of Ephesus, but they came to, they came to meet him. And he speaks about this, this part of life. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak or the poor. And remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so it, it, it just it seems like, there's numerous other passages, it, it just seems like when you look at the life of Jesus, when you look at the life of the early church, they knew a life of laboring. And when we look at America today, we know a life where it's all about, let's just be honest with each other, it's about leisure. It's about working enough so I can enjoy leisure. Is there something wrong with leisure? No. In balance. In balance. But if my life, phew, finally got retired. Man, I'm 55, I'm 60, I'm 65, whatever it is. And I'm able to retire and it's my life. Worked hard. Made the money. What am I going to do all day, every day? I know. I will enjoy leisure. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's not the voice of God. Now, I'm not here to give you a guilt trip, but I am here to say it's Father's Day. And if the man in your life, and I think this is a drive in ladies as well, I'm just, it's just Father's Day, so I'm, I'm going that, you know, I'm going that imbalance. I think we want to affirm men to their death, if they're able, working hard at ministry, if at all possible, but certainly making money where that's necessary. We work hard so we can be generous with our life in ministry and with our money in industry. Does that make sense? Now again, challenge this congregation. Challenge everybody. Find me a passage that has a warning or an implied warning. Don't work too hard. Find me that passage. And I'll give you a bunch of others of the like that I just read. All right? So, <laughs> verse 20. No, I want one passage. I want, I want to be in balance. I want to be balanced. Okay? All right? So, we labor to be generous. That's part of the, the, the image of God that we recognize on the inside. All right. That's verse, uh, uh, um, where are we at? verse 28. Okay? Verse 29. Here's the next one. So, so no, you know, for Father's Day, number 28, you know, just affirm, understand and affirm guy, a guy's need for labor. And it goes the other direction, too. I think ladies are designed for labor as well, and you certainly do. It's just not Mother's Day, so I'm not talking about that, all right? Uh, you know, well, you're raising the kids and doing all, you know, all the stuff and, and taking a job and two jobs and three jobs. And, but I'm not talking about you today, all right? Verse 29, let no unwholesome... Yeah, I'm not going to say, you know, lady, never mind. I, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Verse 29, let's move on. Got my text here. I got to be, I got to be careful to, to obey the text. Verse 29, let no unwholesome, and, and the word is, the, the Greek word is, is the word rotten, like rotten fruit. Okay. Don't let any rotten, don't let any, any unwholesome, and wholesome is a good translation. Any unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. What's an unwholesome word? Something you wouldn't say to Jesus Christ. All right? Because he happens to be present some of the time. Yeah, all the time. Okay? He's listening. You know, we, we always have an audience. And it's Jesus. All right? And we don't say what we say so we don't get squashed. That's not the point. We say what we say. Uh, next verse. To not grieve him. He loves us. We love him. We don't want him grieved. Everybody good with that? That's verse 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. Let no unwholesome. What is unwholesome? It's, it's kind of simple. 
it's whatever you wouldn't say in front of Jesus, okay? Uh, is joking around okay? Yeah, it's just really hard. Because Jesus is listening, and he loves the people that we're talking to, and he loves the people we're talking about, okay? So it's, it's just a hard thing to do. You know, it's an interesting time. We, uh, in, in, uh, in news recently, one of the comedians was talking about comedy is getting really boring these days. Uh, because, now, he's talking about secular comedy, um, which we don't tune into, but um, uh, we probably hear enough of it just around the, you know, just around the horn. Um, but he's saying, because everybody doesn't want to say anything that either now or next week, when the new rules are invented, will offend somebody. You know, and then you're socially ostracized, right? You're, you're canceled, right? So you got a good joke, but you can't say it because it's okay. You checked all the rules, can say it this week, but what about next week? Might not be able to say it next week because some, some group of people will be offended next week. And so comedy's gotten really boring, is what this guy was complaining about. And I'm thinking, you know, that's probably a good thing. That we're, as a culture, we're slowing down. Now, obviously, all this political correctness is, is uh, most, the large majority is obviously nonsense from a biblical perspective. Um, but the slowing down a little bit in society to think about words, that's not a bad thing. Uh, by the way, um, uh, the experts... I don't know who they are, okay? The experts out there. Tell us, and I don't know how, you, how in the world, like you put a little odometer, you see how far you walk, all that kind of thing. I don't know if there's something for the mouth, Russ, but they, they tell us that we speak about 20, 25,000, 30,000 words, a, we'll just call it 20, 20,000 words a day. Some of you go, my spouse is just, that's breakfast. That's, you know, all right? Others are going, my husband doesn't speak that many words in a, in a month or a half a year. You know, so, so again, it's it real, you know, but let's just, let's just say, let's go with the experts. It's just about 20,000 words a day. I want you to think about that. 20,000 words a day. Just call it 10,000 words a day. How do your words, how do my words measure up to this passage? Let's look at the passage. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word, none, proceed from your mouth. So first of all, no unwholesome word. But then the next phrase, only such a word as is good for edification. What's edification? Upbuilding, like building a house. Constructive, going to build somebody up. Do I speak only words that will build up those who hear? According, next phrase, according to the need of the moment. Am I in tune with the moment? What's going on? Again, we talked about it's Father's Day, you know, and, and, and we can be celebrative, most of us, on Father's Day. But, but, but if somebody's in the circle and they're grieving because of a father situation in some way, what's the need of that moment? Oh, are we in tune to that? Okay, so according to the need of the moment, that it might impart grace to the one who hears. What's grace? They may have spoken a bad word to you, a nasty word to you. The only thing that should come out of my mouth to them is what will build them up, even though they just got done trying to tear me down. Am I reading that right? Does that work in marriage? For the stronger one at the moment to uphold this? Wouldn't be a bad plaque on the wall of the bedroom, the living room. Does that work in the church? Sometimes they're having a bad day and they, you know, a little bit later they lash out at you for something, whatever, you know. I don't think it happens a whole lot here, but, you know, just an incredible congregation. But if it were for the stronger to... Speak only what is good for edification. Only what... So if my 10, 20,000 words, are all of them good to edify anybody listening to me? You know, we talk about our, our, the government listening to our phones. I, 
with, with exception of when I'm talking to people about, you know, uh, uh, suicide and, and that kind of thing, not my own normally, but, <laughs> you know, as the case may be, um, now that the playground is about as close to done, at least it's done for right now, I, I'm, I'm a little less suicidal at the point. Uh, um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so, so you know, in regard to, to, to folks tapping the phone and listening in, would they be edified in my conversation? Whoever's eavesdropping, listening in, those who hear, imparting grace. Grace is giving them what they may not deserve. They deserve a piece of my mind. Well, it's not that much there to begin with, but no, they deserve what God wants you to give them, and that's edification. And that can be correction. That can be affirmation. It's never going to be flattery. It's always going to be the truth in love, verse 15 of chapter 4. But whatever is to build them up, how do we do this? Uh, Proverbs, num number one, I think we need to appreciate the power of the tongue. If we're going to do this, I think the starting place is God has given to us a tongue and it's a powerful instrument. And I think because there's so much verbiage all day long, every we can't stand it if someone's not talking. Right? If we're, if we're driving a car together, someone's not talking, it's like, we're uneasy. It's okay for there to be a lot of silence in your relationship with whoever it is that you're with. Guys, you've got to talk to your wife a little bit, but you, you know what I'm saying? All right, so, so silence isn't a bad thing. Think about it before you say it. So, so the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18, verse 21. Love to have that on a wall nearby. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, those who value it, will eat its fruit. It's life-giving. Edification is life-giving to my, to my dad if he were alive. Give, what's a great gift to give to your father today? Life. How do you do that? Edify him. If you're able to. Or your spiritual dad. Many men in this church are looked up to as that. Edify. How can I build him up? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its good fruit. We also got to focus on the heart, number two. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart, Jesus said. Now, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. And he goes on to say, we will give an account, listen now, for every careless word. That's a word that we haven't given care to before we speak it. That's why we are to be very slow to speak throughout Proverbs. How many Proverbs? Be very slow to speak. Where there are many words, sin is unavoidable. Slow down care about your words think of the power of words i'm talking to me use them to edify my tongue needs to be a, a, a ministry of grace to others colossians chapter 4 verse 6 let your speech always be with grace what does that mean it's not about what the other person deserves because they've been mean to me or my spouse is having a bad day or whatever what does grace demand? If I love them dearly as God loves me, what would I speak to them? That's what I need to speak. What's going to be helpful? What's going to be edifying? It could be a word of correction, but done in a gracious way. Let your speech always be with grace, as it were, seasoned with salt. and That's an influence. So that you might know how you, how you sh should respond to every person. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and following. Just jot that down. It's a great passage on this. So we've got to focus on the heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. The problem is this. Proverbs 10, verse 19. Where there are many words, sin is unavoidable. He who restrains his lips is wise. You say, well, well why is that? Uh, James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not bridle, means put a control on his tongue, can't just let it flap, 
but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. That's, that's, the, that's the power God attributes to the tongue. By the way, God spoke the universe into existence. Think about that. Giving us an example of the power of the tongue. Speaking. And so in James chapter 3, verse 2 and following, gives uh, three illustrations. One, horses, we control horses by a bit in the mouth. Two, we control ships by a little thing called the rudder, which is likened under the tongue in the illustration. Three, we can set a forest aflame by a match, a little tiny flame. You can set an entire forest on fire. So the tongue is set among our members, and it can be set on fire by hell or by demonic influence. Verse 8, no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we praise our God. With it, we curse people made in the image of God. Brothers, these things should not be. But they are, and the point is, as we focus on the heart, we've got to realize there is the old man, that's the context of what we're talking about, if we just let our tongues go, the old man has some things to say to those who hear. And so the only hope we have is, number one, focus on the heart, focus on grace toward other people. What does grace demand that I say all the time, period, end of story? What does grace demand? What is, what, 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 what's going to edify in this situation? At the same time, I can't trust my heart entirely because it's a fallen nature, so I have to put a bridle on my tongue. No, Christian, no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. The old man remains. So I can't just start yapping. Got to slow down. Got to think before I speak. What am I thinking? Is this going to be edifying? Does that mean you can talk about, um, here's a sore topic, the Tampa Bay Lightning? Just have to be careful. Absolutely. It, you know, it's, it, that's something God's given to us as part of the image of God. The whole creativity in sports, the creativity in music, creativity in the arts, creativity. You know, all that, that, that's, those are things that God's given to us to enjoy and to talk about those things. They can't dominate our entire conversation. But to talk about those things, to joke around. All of that's good if we're thinking, is this edifying or not? All right? It's a hard thing to use the tongue. It's a powerful tool that God's given to us. So, let no unwholesome word come out of you. That means we bridle the tongue. It's not coming out if it's from the fallen nature and it's going to be unwholesome or unedifying. Only such a word comes out, which is good for edification, which as we're thinking about showing grace to others, it will come out. It will come up and we let it out according to the need, what's going on at the moment, at that time, that it gives grace. That's a love that's undeserved to those who hear. Amen? Everybody good with that? Next one. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's interesting where this is found, this, this, this next quality that needs to be in our life. Verse 30. It's number five on, on, on the list as I'm counting. Right in the middle, and I think what, he, what he's saying is God's Spirit has sealed, when, we've, when we trusted Christ, way back in, in chapter 1 and verse 13. Remember all those blessings we have from God that God chose to give us before eternity began. All right? All of those blessings, verse 13, one of them was you were sealed in Jesus. Seal, that means you're, you're eternally secure in Jesus with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so the drive is, we, if you're a believer, the evidence is there. You're living a life of worship. You're seeing the, the evidence of the new person at work. The evidence is there. You're believing in Christ. You were dead. You're made alive by grace through faith. 
The evidence is there. You're sealed in the Holy Spirit. You're secure, and that security should not drive us to go, well, I can do whatever I want to do. No, if I'm secure and He's dwelling in me, that should drive me to love Him all the more and do only what pleases Him, not what grieves Him. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. Everything said of the Father is said of the Son, is said of the Holy Spirit. I should say almost everything. Said of all three. He's a person. He can be grieved. We don't refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. He's a him. He is morally pure. He loves those you're talking to. He is grieved when we disobey any of these things that are part of the new man. It grieves him. We don't be obedient because we're afraid he's going to squash us. We're obedient because we want to please him. We don't want to grieve him. He's present with us. We're sealed in him. Christ is in us. We're in Christ. The Holy Spirit's in us. We're in the Holy Spirit. We're sealed together for that day of redemption. We're gonna, that's our home. When we die, when Jesus comes back again, we're going home. We're going to be with him forever. That's our home. That's our kingdom. That's where we want to be. And so we want to live that way right now. Uh, in, in, in chapter 5, verse 18, we'll get to this in a few weeks, should the Lord tarry. Be being filled with the Holy Don't get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation. But be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things or in all things to the Father, being submissive to one another. So those four qualities, those four participles, the four, four qualities are ours as we are not filled with wine, but filled with the Spirit of God. That's what God's Spirit guides the new person into. Uh, that's a household, that's a marriage, that's a household of worship. And that's what we want. great deal for Dad today is a home of worship where we're really listening for the voice of God. It's really the key to all of these things. And then let me, get, let me do um, uh, these two and we'll call it good. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's number six. And then number seven goes with it. On the other hand, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Six and seven go together. Bitterness. What is that? You know it's there. If there's another person, your spouse, your husband, or anybody else, if there's another person and you don't find yourself rooting for their good, you're bitter. That's a harbor, you're harboring unforgiveness for something. We need to, as God's Spirit fills us, be rooting for each other. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. And if I find an inability to weep with those who weep, if I find an inability to rejoice with those who rejoice and want the greatest joy and well-being and fullness of love and life for another individual... The root is probably bitterness. And Hebrews tells us, the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, make sure, Christian, there is no root of bitterness coming up and defiling you and others. We, bitterness is a huge thing. It's forgiveness. We're going to talk about how to forgive next time. You say, well, you, it's Father's Day. <clears throat> you don't know what my dad did to me. I was raped. I was beaten. You have no idea how hard this is. And, and we're going to, we'll start, we're planning to uh, start with that next time we're together in the book of, uh, of Ephesians, which I think is next week, right? I think I'm here. Um, let, I mean, who knows? If the rapture happens, you're on your own. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. Let, let, uh, let all, that, was that edifying? That wasn't edifying. <laughs> let all bitterness, put that away. 
And we're going to talk about how to do that next week. I've just got, got to warm you up to it. Wrath and anger kind of go together. They're just almost synonyms, a little bit of nuance difference. I don't want to go into it right now. So that's getting angry. So you, you got bitterness. Well, we know what this is in a marriage. We bring bitterness in from something that happened in childhood. You bring it into your marriage, it will defile your marriage. You'll t- you will take it out on your spouse. You will. Any bitterness remaining in business, from childhood, whatever it is, you've got to get some help with that. It will defile the rest of your life. So bitterness, it's interesting, he starts with bitterness. You, from child, we've got, to, we've got to take care of that. Please, there's a team here, we're glad to help you out with this. You need to be able to think of any individual on the planet and not be bitter. Someone murdered a family member. We can work through that where you can live Free of bitterness. Give us a call. Let bitterness, wrath, anger. and so, so bitterness is what we bring in. Then we find ourselves more easily getting angry and full of wrath toward others when something's going bad. And then the result of that is clamor. That's just starting yelling. Just yelling stuff. It's clamor. Nobody here has ever done that. Pots are just flying with no clamor. Clamor and slander. What is slander? You're just putting other people down, putting the other person down because you're mad at them. Let it be put away from you. See, that's so easy to say. We're going to talk about how to do that next week. Along with all malice. What's, the, what's malice? The intent to harm somebody else. Praying for their demise. Working, speaking, whatever it is for their demise. On the other hand, and again, this is just introducing the topic we'll get to next week. Verse 32 replace that stuff and the key to the christian life is not i'm going to stop doing this i'm going to stop doing that's not the key the key to the christian life is i am going to focus on and here's what we focus on be three things be kind to one another that's a general word for good gentle kind not nice not nice isn't in the bible jesus wasn't nice when he spoke to the religious leaders the way that he did. When he cleansed the... That wasn't nice. Man, boys are not called... You're not going to hear me in the boys club go, Okay, boys, be nice to one another. You're not, 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 not going to hear that from me this week in VBS. It's not in the Bible. Be kind to one another is. Going to talk about that next time. Be kind to one another. Here's the help of that. Tender heart. That's feeling what others feel. Choosing to try to see things through their eyes. And we're going to blow it, so, and that's implied here, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. What a loaded expression. What do we do before next week? I want you to think about how God in Christ, in Christ, you're united to Christ, how God in Christ has forgiven you. People who can't forgive, even the worst, and I'm talking, there's some heavy things to forgive, weighty things imagine being abused and and the like very weighty things to forgive or having again a family member murdered or any number of horrific things god gives us the ability the power by his guidance and by his uh, community and by um by his empowerment uh to, to to do this but If I can't forgive another person, it's either that I'm too arrogant to receive the forgiveness of God, I'm not going to trust Christ, or I am trusting Christ, but I'm too arrogant to think that God could possibly forgive me, so I'm not experiencing His forgiveness moment by moment, day by day. I'm not taking extended times to just contemplate this is just a good time for, for, for prayer right now. Let's just go into prayer right now. Uh, God, we just confess to you, we, you know, we, we, too many of us here, some of us here at least, me, haven't taken the time recently to really contemplate how much we've been forgiven. Living as absolute rebels with a finger held up to you, many of us, for years. 
And yet every thought, every word, every action, inexcusable stuff, done to you and done to other people, we're 100% forgiven without us earning any of it, meriting any of it. We only merited hell. Death and hell is all we merited. And, and you went to such an extent that you took on humanness. You came to this planet. You bore abuse. And you purposely went to a cross. The extent you went to to forgive me, you went to a cross. And you reached into my life. And if you haven't spoken these words to him, just, just speak them the best way you can. And you reached into my life because you're God and you're not limited by time. And you took every thought, word, and action of rebellion I ever have done or ever will do on your body. That I might know your forgiveness. You paid the price for everything in my behalf. My God, my creator, my king, the holy one, the only holy one, paid everything. You died in my place. You rose again. You're in heaven after 40 days went into heaven and you are alive and you are present and you offer me the gift of eternal life and the gift of total forgiveness and by your grace, I'm trusting you. And now I have the audacity to go but I, I can't forgive this other person based on what they've done to me Lord Jesus guide us this week to really think about meditate on speak to our hearts we're asking you how much we have been forgiven prepare us for next week we pray thank you for this word today thank you for the dads that are here Father, we pray for each dad, spiritual dad, and each uh, physical, each, each blood dad, uh, Father, that you would make us a blessing to them, guide us in giving them the new us with these qualities and practices we've been looking at. Thank you for great grace today. In Jesus' name, amen. This uh, area is open. There's, li there's small groups, life groups for uh, all ages um, following this time. But this, this area down here is open. Uh, if you want prayer for anything, come on down. Um, God bless each one of you. God make you a blessing.